Hi everybody, my name is Max. I, uh, I'm a member or former member, uh, member of Sizzle. I uh, just graduated, uh, so I'm moving on to other things, but uh, I'm going to be talking to you about um, something that I uh, spent a good amount of time working on uh, while I was a grad student here, uh, which is uh, the software framework called PalmDB.js. Um, so we're calling it a unified PalmDB framework, and um, I think for the most part that's accurate generally when you have kind of like these, uh, these titles, they tend to be sensationalist, but we really try to, to focus on uh, this unified part, and I'll tell you what I mean by that uh, in the presentation. And so also, uh, another thing I'll note is that uh, there's actually two presentations on this uh, software framework. Uh, Zach from our lab is also doing one. Um, I guess when you, when you host the workshop, you get you get two presentations um, from whatever you want to do, but um, what I'll be talking about is more uh, what PalmDBs.jl is, and uh, Zach will be talking about uh, kind of like the design choices and how the users uh, have, have uh, used PalmDBs.jl. And I think both of those are, are fairly valuable. Um, so um, let, let's get started. So uh, what, uh, what is PalmDBs.jl? So uh, in short, it's a collection of solvers and tools for solving PalmDBs in Julia. Uh, so Julia is a fairly new uh, numerical computing programming language. Um, it's, uh, it's very nice because it's, uh, it's a dynamic programming language, which is kind of, uh, in a sense, similar to languages like Python and MATLAB. Uh, but it doesn't have uh, the slowdown to those languages. So it's, it's quite fast without needing to do like vectorization um, like you would in, uh, in Python with NumPy, for example, if you wanted to speed up your code. Uh, so, um, uh, we, we wrote this package in Julia because um, it, it gives us flexibility in, in, uh, in basically allowing us to define problems in um, many general formats. Um, and I'll show you guys what I mean by that in just a bit, but before, uh, before I go on, I, I just really want to briefly, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, kind of really give a very brief definition of what a Palm BP is. So I think uh, most of you are probably familiar with uh, what MDPs are, Markov Decision Processes. These are essentially decision-making models uh, where the dynamics are stochastic. So uh, there's a probabilistic model for how um, the environment um, uh, changes over time. Uh, now, a Palm DP is an extension of an MDP where the dynamics are stochastic, but um, there's also state uncertainty. So you don't know what the world, uh, what the state of the world is. You just have an observation, and then you try to make a decision based on those observations. Um, so in short, that's a Palm DP. Um, now, uh, the fact that there's state uncertainty in the problem makes it much more difficult to solve. And so um, it, uh, it requires, a, 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 essentially, the scalability of PalmDB algorithms is not as good as uh, MDP algorithms. Uh, and the other thing is, uh, it also requires um, um, an additional uh, kind of model for, for how, you, uh, how your observations and states relate. And so that makes it more difficult. But in the end, what we want to do with this framework is be able to solve MDPs, PalmDPs in a very flexible manner. Uh, so um, now, uh, back to PalmDPs.jl. Uh, so uh, originally when we were starting this framework, we were kind of, uh, uh, within our lab, asking uh, these different questions. Things like, um, uh, for example, I want to be able to model and solve PalmDPs but languages like Python are too slow, and C++ is too low level. I know Scott would probably think that's not true, but uh, for some of us uh, younger kids who are not used to uh, you know, compiled languages, uh, we would prefer to work in dynamic languages where prototyping is faster. Um, and, and essentially, uh, you, know, you get the overhead in C++ uh, of kind of development time, uh, and then in Python, you get the overhead of uh, runtime. Uh, and so Julia, uh, so that's why we kind of chose Julia, to kind of uh, uh, be able to address both of these issues. So dynamic language, that's fast. Um, the other thing is, um, so the other question is, uh, uh, the things that we wanted to see was, uh, we want to implement algorithms, um, right, so it, in, in this uh, language that's designed for numerical computing, and uh, that provides abstractions that allow us to do numerical computing quickly and prototype quickly. And that's, uh, once again, the answer for that is Julia. Um, and I'll tell you why in, in just a few slides. So um, a couple other things that we were thinking about is we wanted to create a framework where it's easy to benchmark different algorithms against each other, um, and also avoid complicated uh, files and formats when defining models. And so uh, typically, it's um, 
it can be difficult to define uh, upon DP. Uh, typically, what, uh, so for example, uh, with Riddle, you guys saw one, one way you could do it is using binary equation networks. Um, typically, what's done is you kind of just define a probability table and assume the, the problem is discrete. Um, but um, we wanted to do something more general. We wanted to uh, be able to approach this problem from the standpoint um, if, imagine you have a big problem that you want to solve and you initially discretize it, but the, the actual state spaces are continuous. Maybe your action states, uh, states actions and observations are all continuous. But in order to, to solve like the first iteration, you have to discretize it. Now, what if you um, solve that discrete problem and now you want to move to the continuous version of the problem? Like, how would you do that? Well, uh, typically, uh, before PomDBs.jl, what you would have to do is, you know, potentially change to a different language, maybe write a new solver, um, recreate the problem from scratch. Like here, what we're doing with PomDBs.jl is basically allowing you the flexibility to just uh, go from the discrete model to continuous model. Uh, by providing like these template, templated abstractions that are very like fairly easy to work with and allow you to just kind of modify your model into um, like between discrete and continuous action spaces quickly. So so really the the I think the selling mark of this framework is um, like fast prototyping and you have the flexibility of um, of using uh, kind of any sort of representation for your states, actions, and observations, which is very nice. Uh, so, how do we do this? So, um, I put in this graphic here, and I kind of, uh, the way that I think of uh, uh, PomDBs.jl and the underlying solvers that are within it is um, kind of this combination of, um, uh, if you're familiar with Julia Opt, uh, it's a very nice organization that provides uh, basically like a generalized interface for all these uh, uh, like linear programming solvers. Uh, and um, it, you only have to write the, for, the problem in one format, and then you go and pick a solver that you want, and then it solves the problem for you. So that's kind of what we want to do. We want to be able to let the user write their problem in one format, and then they can pick and choose what solvers they want to use and, and see, uh, uh, compare the solutions. And um, the, other, the other kind of aspect to this is like we, we want to have um, fast prototyping. And that's kind of, uh, I think, um, in the machine learning community, like people typically use things like scikit-learn, where they, it doesn't necessarily scale very well to larger problems, but you can get something running very quickly. And so you have this fast like problem exploration. Um, and so kind of combining these two um, really uh, ideas in, into, into the decision making, uh, into the PomDP uh, area, is uh, what Julia PomDP tries to do. Um, and so um, the goal of, uh, of this framework is to really think of uh, of the whole uh, of the process of solving these problems from three different perspectives. So there is the problem, which is the PomDP. And um, by the way, this is kind of what um, a, a schematic for our interface. Um, and it's it's divided into three different areas where you have the problem solver, the problem, the solver, and the experiment. And um, the the problem is is the PomDP, and it provides. Um, our framework provides these templates uh, through which you can define uh, the PomDP. Um, so there's there's some functionality that you have to define for your problem. You have to define the transition model, the observation model, and so forth. Um, and those can be used to basically, that, that information can be used by the solver uh, to compute a policy for the PomDP or the MOP. Um, and uh, putting the problem and the solver together um, into the experiment gives you some results. Um, and so those are kind of the three main perspectives and our whole, um, uh, the, the whole design philosophy was centered around this idea. And I think uh, it allows us to kind of think very easily about uh, what we want to see um, in our interface and how to, uh, how to really uh, make it general enough but minimal enough where uh, the, the user doesn't get confused by like complicated um, like function definitions, etc. It's it's fairly straightforward, um, and uh, but it, it allows the user the flexibility to kind of do what they want. And so, um, uh, really briefly, I want to just go over the what the Julia what PomDPs.jl is and how it falls within the Julia PomDP organization. So Julia PomDP is essentially 
our, our organization on GitHub where all these different repositories live. Uh, so we have pompeys.jl, which in itself is just uh, the definition of our uh, templates uh, of the interface. So within that, we have um, uh, essentially the kind of the, the recipe for how the user should define a model. Um, but once again, there's enough generality in that where the user has flexibility to define the model in many different ways. And I'll show you guys examples of how we do that. Um, there's, there's a few other um, uh, uh, packages within Julia Palm DP. So we have Palm DP Toolbox, which provides different tools um, for working with Palm DPs and help, uh, helping you model Palm DPs. Um, it provides things like simulators, state estimators, and some policies that um, can be used by the solvers or by um, uh, essentially people who are modeling Palm DPs, just to make it simpler, to reduce that kind of the code overhead. Um, and then we have Palm DP models.jl. This is kind of just like the environment suite. If you're familiar with OpenAI Gym, that's what like Palm DP models is kind of like the OpenAI Gym for our, our framework. We just throw in a bunch of uh, uh, models in there. Uh, users can use them for benchmarking so they don't have to re-implement them. So this allows you to do bench benchmarking in a very simple way. Um, and then we have all the solvers that also live within that organization. Um, uh, things like uh, QMDP, Value Iteration, PalmCP, MCTS. Um, uh, so basically we have PalmDP and MDP solvers and some reinforcement learning um, algorithms implemented as well. Um, so that, that is in itself the organization. Uh, now, um, I want to uh, briefly talk a little bit about how uh, what the templates look like um, for for defining a Palm DP model in, in our framework. So um, this uh, this uh, little code snippets here are uh, uh, basically uh, just an example of how you define something like uh, the Tiger Palm DP. So the Tiger Palm DP is kind of a classic uh, Palm DP problem. Um, it's, it's fairly simple to solve, so it's used, um, I, actually I'm not sure if it's even used as a benchmark just because it's such a small problem, but it makes a nice example. Um, and um, what, what you're seeing here is um, some Julia code for a, a type definition. A type is just like a, a C structure, so you can think of it as just like a container for um, uh, ver uh, other, other data. Um, but uh, also, um, what, what the Tiger Palm DP is doing is it's inheriting from this Palm DP um, abstract type, which is defined in, in our Palm DPs.gl interface. And within that, um, it's parameterized by the state, action, and observation types of the problem. So you see here we have bool, int, and bool. So that's um, uh, the parameter that's basically the types for the states, uh, the state space action, or for the states, actions, and observations. So in the Tiger problem, um, the states. Uh, I don't really explain it, but basically the states can be represented uh, with a Boolean variable. The actions, there's three actions, so they're represented by an integer, and uh, the observations are also Boolean. Um, and, um, uh, but here, you, what you can see from, from this like templated uh, parameterized definition is that you can put whatever you want into the state action observation types. So you can have continuous variables, you can have more complicated structures, you could even put in uh, 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 like factored structures, maybe something like a, that has some form of rotation network so you can factor your problem and exploit the structure. So it's very flexible. Um, it doesn't really require you to use um, any specific type for uh, state actions and observation. And um, just um, to give you an example, uh, the couple functions that the user would define would be like the transition observation function. Um, they would take in the Tiger Palm DP and notice, uh, so in Julia, uh, you can uh, add in type assertions, and um, Julia has multiple dispatch. So it allows you to dispatch the function based on the type input. So for example, since we've defined the Tiger Palm DP, um, when we pass in our uh, Tiger Palm DP type into the transition function, it will call the function that the, the user defined for this problem. Um, now, um, the other thing that I want to mention briefly before, kind of, before showing you guys a demo is, um, uh, this idea of explicit versus generative models. So, in um, uh, there's been a lot of uh, kind of excitement around reinforcement learning, um, uh, just because uh, deep learning has really helped with that. Um, and then reinforcement learning, what you have is a generative model. So you have an environment that you uh, essentially uh, generate uh, uh, 
next states and rewards from. So like if you're familiar with OpenAI Gym, that's the, it implements a bunch of generative models for these different environments. Um, and um, the other way to define uh, these types of problems, whether they're MDPs or PlumDPs, is using explicit probabilistic models. Um, so uh, these could be like uh, Bayesian networks, for example, like in Riddle. Um, or you can just define some other types of probability distributions that tell you uh, what transition and observation models of your problem look like. And that's usually uh, quite a bit more work. Um, so in, um, in, in our framework, you can do both. Um, uh, what, uh, what really limits you, for example, if you, if you decide to just define the generative model, which is simpler to define, you can't use all of the solvers. So you can't use the solvers that require the explicit model. Uh, but if you define the explicit model, uh, uh, the, the framework automatically wraps the generative model for you, so you can just pass, the, pass, on, pass in your explicit model into any solver, essentially. So uh, if, you have, if you have the explicit model definition, you should be able to essentially use any solver in the framework. Um, Okay, so um, that, uh, that's kind of the quick rundown of the framework, and I want to show you guys uh, a demo um, uh, of uh, kind of what implementing a problem would look like. So this is the Tiger Palm DP problem, um, and it, the, the problem consists of uh, an agent that has to decide uh, uh, between a door, so there are two doors, a left and a right, and uh, behind one of those doors is a tiger. Uh, the agent, uh, so the problem is palm B, as a palm BB, by the way, and the reason is that the agent doesn't know where the tiger is. So the agent uh, receives a listening observation when they choose to listen, um, and they can also choose to open uh, one of the doors. Um, and uh, within some probability, the agent receives the correct uh, location of the tiger, um, and with, with, with some other probability, receives the, the, wrong, the, the wrong location of the tiger. So um, the agent doesn't know where the tiger is, and they have to pick the door which doesn't have the tiger otherwise located. And so uh, what, the, what the code for that looks like is, um, so first we're going to do some importing, and um, this is just Julia's syntax for loading in um, uh, different packages. Um, we have this import all. Um, call to Palm DPs because what we're doing is we're um, uh, adding uh, additional uh, functions to uh, dispatch our Palm DP model on. So you, you have to import everything from Palm DPs before you can kind of uh, um, add to the function table for, for the same the function name. So essentially you're kind of importing it into this namespace. Um, now this is the, uh, the, the Tiger Palm DP type uh, looks something like this. There's some information about the rewards and the probabilities, and there's also a discount factor in there. That's not uh, really that important. You can put whatever you want into this, uh, into this type. It just probably should contain information uh, specific to your problem. Um, so um, just defining some constants for our actions and observations. So um, the type uh, the agent can listen, they can open left or right door, and then the observations that they receive are is that the tiger's on the left or the tiger's on the right. Um, now, um, before, uh, before you can define an explicit model, you really have to think about how you represent, um, represent it using uh, the distribution, uh, uh, how you represent distributions within that model. So you need to define explicitly the transition observation uh, models um, in your problem. And there's many different ways to do it. For example, uh, Julia has uh, a nice package called distributions.jl which uh, handles many different uh, probability distributions. And uh, uh, we, uh, in, in this demo, I just decided to define my own because it's, it's fairly simple. It's just a Boolean distribution because um, we're just dealing with a binary variable here. And so that distribution needs to be able to, um, you need to be able to sample from it and you need to be able to get, um, it, this is the, essentially the, the probability of, of the variable that you sample. Uh, from that distribution. So this is the PDF function. It's not really uh, the density. It's um, the, really the mass, but um, it, it depends on, on the variable. So the continuous spaces would be the PDF, uh, but we just decided to stick with a, with a single name. So but that's just uh, that's just notation. Um, now um, there's also the transition model. So um, this is just saying that uh, once uh, the agent finds the tiger, they'll, uh, the tiger resets its position. It's fairly straightforward. And then um, the observation model um, includes, uh, uh, 
essentially the probability uh, of uh, it, it, it incorporates the, the probability of the tiger uh, of not being uh, not hearing the tiger correctly behind one of the doors, uh, and so uh, and, and once again uh, these two functions uh, return a distribution from which you can either call uh, on which you can call the PDF function from or from which you can sample. Um, the reward model um, the details aren't that important here, but essentially it's bad to open the door with a tiger, um, and then some convenience functions so we can use a all the solvers that um, are uh, that I want to show you guys, um, and so uh, now what we do here is uh, we export uh, the QMDP solver, um, and um, within our framework we have this nice uh, because the user is required to define all these functions. Uh, sometimes it can be a pain to kind of figure out what you need to, to, to implement in order to use a specific solver. So there is this um, Julia macro which is called requirements info, uh, which you call on the solver and your, and your model after you initialize it. And it tells you whether or not you've implemented all the functions. Um, so that's kind of nice. So you, you can, after you, you create your problem, you can call this and then make sure that everything, uh, everything has been implemented. Um, and then you're ready to go. Uh, one, one really quick thing. So you can see that this is actually, I mean, it's not, it's not a lot of code, but for a simple problem, it's, you know, I don't know, maybe there's like 50 lines here, maybe a little more, I'm not sure, um, which, is, which is a lot. So, it, and if you're coming from the traditional Palm VP um, uh, kind of background, uh, you're probably used to defining discrete models using probability tables, and you can do that. So that requires only a few lines of code. So within our framework, uh, we have, uh, in Palm VP models, we have this discrete Palm VP model. Um, if you define the reward transition observation tables, in code, um, you can just pass that in and it implements all the functions for you. So that's kind of nice. Um, once again, we can check the requirements, see that all the functions are there, it works. Um, so really quickly, I just want to show you guys how you can uh, use uh, different <coughs> solvers uh, with, uh, on this on this tiger problem. Uh, so I imported the SARS up in the Palm, DP, Palm CP solver. So these are different uh, Palm DP solving algorithms. Um, and um, th what this, this is doing is just um, running the solver. So it's computing uh, all these different policies. There's a Palm CP policy, a SARSA policy, and a QMDP policy. So now that we have these, it's actually very easy to compare how well each of these uh, solvers does on this algorithm. Uh, and um, uh, we can set up a simulator, which you can um, import from uh, Palm DP toolbox and uh, just run, run some simulations. Um, Actually, I think Palm CP takes a little bit of time, and then you see um, some rewards. I'm not sure. I guess I ran Palm CP from like, 10 trajectories, and then um, more for the other two. But um, you, you see that Palm CP actually gets a uh, fairly low reward, and I think we probably need to tune some hyperparameters in there before it works well. I just kind of use the default um, version of that. So I think uh, that's pretty much it. But but the nice thing is like you can you can very very quickly um, prototype your your, um, your problem here, and um, you can just pick the solver that you want and um, quickly run a simulation and see how well it does. Um, so that, that's fairly nice. Um, now, uh, we also, um, you can also, uh, Julia has um, very nice doc string support, so you can use question mark and uh, either type in the function name or the type, and it will tell you something about it. So that's kind of, uh, uh, there's also documentation online and things like that, so if you're interested in looking uh, at it more, check out the, the GitHub page, which is uh, just uh, like JuliaPalmDP slash PalmDP.jl. So all our documentation is on there. Um, now, I think I'm over. Um, but really quickly, uh, just going forward, uh, we're thinking of uh, adding deep reinforcement learning algorithms to, um, to be able to work with these problems. Um, and um, uh, essentially integrating existing frameworks. So the nice thing is Julia is now getting up to speed with all the deep learning libraries. There's some nice choices uh, to pick from, and so uh, uh, that's kind of the next steps here. Um, so um, I'll finish up and I'll answer any questions. If there are. Let's say you have a new solver. How difficult is it to integrate it into? Right. Uh, so I didn't 
I didn't talk uh, at all about that, but um, essentially, what um, there's also like a solver template that um, our framework defines, and um, there isn't really much that you need to, to define for that. So there's like a solve function, and the solver requires a policy. So um, if you have a solver, you would have to define those. Um, but otherwise, uh, you can just assume that you have access to like the the model uh, functions that the template has. So you can maybe either use a generative model, so you can sample you know sample from the environment, or use the explicit probability definitions, or um, even you can you can even assume that you have access to like the belief state, so you can like get the the beliefs uh, of the problem. So it, it's really it's really up to you, and of course like. You know the difficulty of the algorithm depends on, on what algorithm you're using, but um, uh, from our experience, it's pretty straightforward. Like um, the, like simple algorithms like value iteration don't take more than like I don't know 50 lines or 60 lines to define. So it's just and it's just some nested loops in there. So it's really um, yeah uh, really depends on the algorithm, and we're kind of building out uh, the support tools in Palm BP Toolbox to make it easier to work with things like belief-based planning. So you can just import um, like for example, if you want to work like belief trees or something like that, you can import uh, a tool that, that helps you like work with those. So um, yeah, the, and we're, we're planning to build it up over time. There's a page of documentation about writing solvers on the website. Yeah, there's there's documentation of that as well. Um, yeah. So I think we have lots of the the motivation for for. Um, you seem to make an assumption that DBM is going to be discrete, but obviously they need continuous as well. So I think DBM is probably a fairly generic uh, uh, formalism. Um, I'm, it, what didn't really come out in the talk, I'm really concerned about two things, like factor structure, uh, which is important for scalability of large problems, and also a hybrid makes discrete continuous structure. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that currently handled? Is it on the uh, in future plans? Great. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a great question. So um, uh, first I'll talk about the hybrid structure. So hybrid structure, um, we don't really have, um, so actually th there are solvers that can handle hy hybrid structure already, like um, Monte Gox Research, for example, with Delaware and why they can handle both continuous and discrete um, state spaces. So for example, if your states are, are hybrid, you should be able to use use that solver. Um, and there, within the framework, the templates um, are generic enough where you can, you can just define your own state type which contains like continuous and discrete variables in it. And so it doesn't, so long as it satisfies, you know, all the function definitions correctly, so long as you can sample from distribution and get a probability distribution over your states, um, it's, you're free to use whatever representation of your, of your state you want. So it can be hybrid yeah. if you want. Uh, as far as- But we have lot of base solvers currently that would exploit that. That's right, so we don't have anything that deals with that. But you could define, um, like your your states, for example, your state spaces in that way. If you want, yeah, it's also compiled to the input they need. That's why I'm not really interested in the compilation aspect, right? Different players need different compilation. Yeah, that's so, right. So this is something that we've thought about, and we haven't really gotten around to working uh, on it too much. But I, I think that would be like the next step in terms of scalability, because now um, you know there's definitely like if you want to exploit problem structure, we don't really have anything uh, really. To, to deal with that, so there is uh, actually an online-based solvers. Maybe Zach will talk about this a little more, but like there, there is some some ways that you can do it, but not in terms of like factor representations, like you're talking about. Um, I, I, from the example, I see basically the syntactic difference between regular and one of these that you know, it wouldn't be impossible to translate. That's right. Maybe that's something that would be actually uh, a good uh, collaboration uh, in the future. I, I think that's definitely something that um, Mike will probably be very open to. Um, just need to convince the next the labor grad students to, to work on that. But I think that would be very useful, actually. Um, and that's kind of a, a, our plan going forward, also integrating with other frameworks, because um, Julia is very nice in that it can call um, other code fairly easily. So 